The newest atrial fibrillation guidelines recommend that all patients with atrial fibrillation be started on rhythm control within one year of diagnosis of AFib. How can we achieve rhythm control? We have three major tools in our toolbox. One, electrical cardioversion. Two, chemical cardioversion. And three, ablation. All attempt to bring the patient into sinus rhythm. So let's start with electrical cardioversion which has both therapeutic and prognostic roles. When we think about the therapeutic standpoint, let's say you have a patient with symptomatic atrial fibrillation or a patient that's hemodynamically unstable. So that is your patient that has a low blood pressure. In this case, electrical cardioversion will act like a reset button for the heart. And that patient can feel much better when they're cardioverted back to sinus rhythm. However, electrical cardioversion is temporary. And that explains its prognostic role. If you have a patient that is electrically cardioverted and they return to AFib soon after, that tells you that you're going to have more difficult to control AFib. That patient may require more medications, higher doses of medications, and ablations to achieve sinus rhythm. So how quickly your patient returns to AFib after they've been electrically cardioverted tells us prognostically how hard it's going to be to keep them in sinus. One important consideration for electrical cardioversion is stroke risk. Patients should be on a blood thinner three weeks prior to the cardioversion and one month post-cardioversion. The other treatment that we have to achieve sinus is chemical cardioversion, aka medications. The most common medications fit into two major classes. You have the class 3 antiarrhythmic medications and the class 1C antiarrhythmic medications. Class 3 is where you will find amiodarone, sodolo, and dofetilide. Class 1C is where you will find flecainide and propafenone. So let's review the pros and the cons of each. Starting off with one of the most common antiarrhythmic drugs, amiodarone. The major pro of amiodarone is its slower load and subsequent reduced risk of cardioversion pause and syncope. That is, a transient stunning in the sinus node resulting in a pause causing someone to pass out. This enhanced safety feature is why it is often the go-to for outpatient loading prior to an ablation. In terms of cons, we often observe adverse effects with chronic use of amiodarone. This includes gradual onset hepatotoxicity, thyroid abnormalities, and pulmonary fibrosis. Next, we have sodolo and dofetilide, the two other class 3 antiarrhythmics. The pro with these two medications is their rapid onset conversion. However, that does come with a higher risk of conversion pause and syncope. There are five major cons to these medications. First, they prolong your QTC, so they require close ECG monitoring, usually that's done inpatient, during dose titration. Second, they're renally cleared, and hence they have GFR cutoffs. Third, if several doses are missed, the medication must be reloaded and retitrated, usually inpatient. Fourth, both increase the risk of torsades, albeit for sodolo, the risk is primarily observed among patients with bradycardia. And lastly, dofetilide has many drug-drug interactions that limit its use with other medications, including antibiotics and even your thiazide diuretics. What about the pros and cons of class 1C antiarrhythmics, that is, flecainide and propafenone? Similar to sodolo and dofetilide, a pro of flecainide and propafenone is their rapid onset conversion. With that said, there's three cons to be mindful of with these medications. First, flecainide and propafenone cannot be used in patients with a low ejection fraction and obstructive coronary artery disease. There is actually a black box warning based on the CAS trial, which found that among these particular patients, flecainide and propafenone could result in a life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia. Second, flecainide and propafenone have greater proarrhythmic effect at faster heart rates, so patients must get a stress ECG done after they are fully loaded on these meds to monitor for QRS changes at these faster heart rates. Lastly, both drugs promote one-to-one -one conversion of a flutter, so patients also need to be on a rate control medication. Now, on to our last tool in our toolbox, catheter ablation. Indications for ablation are for one, your symptomatic patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, or two, your patient with atrial fibrillation and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction on GDMT. That being said, many electrophysiologists argue that ablation should be discussed with all patients with atrial fibrillation. 
The rationale behind offering cardioversion is the earlier we get patients back into sinus, the better their long-term outcomes. So let's review. The latest guidelines provide a first-line recommendation for rhythm control for new AFib within one year of diagnosis. We can achieve sinus rhythm via electrical cardioversion, chemical cardioversion, or ablation. Electrical cardioversion is a reset button for the heart, and it works temporarily. It may be indicated acutely in a symptomatic patient who is hemodynamically unstable. For chemical cardioversion, there are five main medications. Amiodarone is slower acting and generally a safer loading drug, but may not be ideal chronically for patients with liver, thyroid, or lung disease, or long-term in general. Sotolol, dofetilide, flecainide, and propafenone all have a more rapid conversion onset. For sotolol and dofetilide, they will need close ECG monitoring inpatient for initial loading and dose titration and will require reloading and titration if doses are ever held. Also, not a good option for CKD patients or patients with bradycardia, given the risk for dersades. Flecainide and propafenone should be avoided in patients with low ejection fraction or obstructive coronary artery disease, warrant a stress ECG to see what happens when their heart rate goes fast, and require rate control agents since these meds can induce one-to-one atrial flutter. First-line indications for ablation evaluation is in patients with symptomatic paroxysmal AFib or a reduced ejection fraction. If you liked our video, please like and subscribe.